So, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Double A Aaron. Um, if you have, if you have never seen me before, I'm a um, educational content developer. So, one of my um, duties is working on the documentation. So, we have, uh, if you've never been to this website before, uh, the core documentation website. There's a uh, three main sections. So we have the references section. So this has stuff about like if you're not familiar with how to save stuff, uh, such as like a persistent score that you know never resets. We have a persistent storage uh, reference page, and it kind of gives you some information. Um, the next section is going to be tutorials. So this is like if you want to make a full project and learn that way. Um, these are a little more longer then the reference pages you're welcome to jump into this uh we also have the core api so this one uh, i call it the coder's bible because it has every single piece of information you would ever need um any questions you may have are answered here you just need to know where to look and uh, how to use the information so if you're wondering like uh, what can i do with the player um there's a player section and it has all these different uh properties um and then we have functions. And then there's even at the very bottom, there's a lot of stuff you can do with the player. At the very bottom, we have these examples showing off how to actually, uh, like snippets of code you can just copy. Um, some cool examples in here too, like ragdolling the player um, from like the neck down. So it has like wavy legs and stuff. So yeah, um, there's a whole bunch of examples and uh, pieces of code you can steal. You know, uh, even the greatest coders still copy and paste code. So uh, don't feel bad if you just copy and paste and maybe change one thing about it. That's uh, that's the magic of coding. You don't need to always do all the heavy lifting. There's probably someone that did it for you. But uh, yeah, I'll uh, just quickly go over some terms. Um, it sounds like we have some coders in the crowd, but I uh, just wanted to uh, double check. If you've never used Lua before, then... Um, Four key terms that you're going to want to know about are variables. They're a way to store information, such as like a player score or uh, just maybe the player's name. Um, they can store just about anything, any piece of memory. Um, functions are more of tasks. So if you need the player to do something when you press a button, like have the player float, you know, launch them in the air and uh, display UI. Uh, you would want to make a function and list all these tasks that you're going to be performing when the player presses that button. Uh, tables are a way to store multiple things, so kind of like expanding on variables. So um, a variable can store a table, um, but tables are kind of like a list of things. So um, if you're familiar with other um, programming languages, you may know uh, you may refer to them as arrays or objects. So it, it can store multiple things and you can kind of like pick and choose what you want to change or use from that table. Um, and then loops kind of work with tables at times. Um, you're able to kind of uh, go through a table. So you have like a table of names, for example, you can use a loop to kind of print them all out. Um, so it's a way to iterate through, if you know that word, um, go through a list. And uh, you can do other stuff with loops such as like, you know, Move the player 10 times or something like that. So loops can be um, good for repetitive things or uh, needing to do more than one thing. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's talk about some uh, helpful windows when you're coding in core. Um, the number one when you're scripting is a script editor. Uh, we have an external editor um, tool. So if you're comfortable using Atom or VS Code is a popular one, the one that I use most of the time. It has a lot of cool uh, features, such as uh, replacing a variable name or finding references across scripts. Um, it can even auto-complete a lot of uh, um, function names that you're constantly using. So uh, I highly advise, if you're going to be doing a lot of scripting, to get familiar with how to set up an external editor. It'll save you a lot of headache. Uh, but for this demonstration, I'm just going to use the internal editor, which means it's inside of the core editor. Um, so I'll show how to open that up. Uh, we also have the event log. So that's kind of our compiler. It's going to show any warnings, errors, or debug messages you have. And we also have a script helper. So this is sort of a built-in API uh, reference that you can use. So it's 
good for like quickly looking up like, oh, how did I, uh, how was I able to move the player? You can quickly look up the player API and see all the different functions you can do, or even search up if you kind of know how to spell uh, the function you're thinking about. And it gives you a lot of information, like how to use it and stuff like that. Uh, it doesn't have examples and all that that the API had, but it does have like, you know, the the basic info to actually use the functions. Um, and then the script generator. So that is a way to get common uh, snippets of code. So these are like examples that you will uh, be using quite often. Um, and it is mainly dealing with events, so, such as the player joining the game. Um, you might need, you, you will be using that a lot for most projects if you're scripting. Um, or like when a player enters a trigger and stuff like that. So script generator is good for just like getting common code and just like copying and pasting it. And also good for learning like how to use events. If you're not familiar with how to set up an event, you can just quickly go there and steal that code. And then the properties window. Um, the properties window is good just to get a sense of like what the object is able to do. Um, and you can also add custom properties. So like if you want to see where the, the object is in the world, you could click on it and look at its properties and it has like the position values. So you can quickly change that to be zero, zero, zero if you need it to be in the center of the world again. Um, but yeah, you can add properties. You can even uh, add references, which is what we're gonna go into uh, right about now. So I think that's the end of the slideshow. Uh, there's some more information, but I think I'm just gonna jump straight in. Uh, there was a question in the chat, so um, Claire was wondering when if we're going to use Unreal Engine 5. Um, so Core is built on Unreal Engine, um, but it's using the Unreal Engine 4. And currently, there is no plans to use Unreal Engine 5. Um, that may change in the future. But as of now, it's Unreal Engine 4. Hope that answered your question. Yes, documentation, very useful. All right, so let's jump in. So how do you make a script? So there's uh, multiple ways to make scripts. Um, you can click the Create Script button at the top here and then Create New Script. You can right-click in the hierarchy and go to the Create menu. You can right-click in the Project Content window and Create Script. And you can also, I think this might be the last way to do it. There's, maybe some other ways, you can use the script generator uh, window, which we talked about. Um, and you're able to create a script here using this pre-built code. And there's like different types of pre-built code that you can use. So we might uh, use that in a second. So the first thing we're gonna do is think about what we wanna do. So the magic of coding is that uh, yes, you can do a lot without coding in core, which is really nice, but there's a lot of things that if you want like a specific thing to happen, such as like when the player enters a area, such as like a house, then I want them to be prompted with a UI. And I also want them to be walking slower and they can't jump anymore. So there's a lot of like specific things that you may want to happen, but there's no way to say, you know, search for that in core content or, you know, maybe someone has done it in community content, but, uh, you know, there might be specific things that is not included in there. So that's where scripting would come in useful, knowing how to uh, control certain aspects of your game um, when certain things are happening. So um, for now, I'm going to be doing a simple example, and I think we're just going to have like a uh, animated mesh that like greets the player when they approach them. So I'm going to start by getting Carl, our favorite animated mesh. And so he's kind of looking at the player at the spawn. And what I, oh, I am also dressed as Carl. That's not going to work. Okay, so uh, what I want to happen is when I approach Carl, I want him to uh, rotate to face me, and I also want him to greet me by waving. So um, the first thing we're going to do, though, is talk about different types in core. So uh, anything inside the hierarchy is an object, and uh, these objects have specific types, So such as the floor, this uh, giant cube that is in every default scene. Uh, this is uh, a static mesh. So that's the specific type that um, 
is um, so static refers to it having a, a constant shape that cannot animate. So the this cube will never you know split in half or whatever. It's always going to have this this mesh that uh, will be static, which means like be constant. Um, this skeleton though is not a static mesh. This is known as an animated mesh. So it's a little bit different. It has properties if you look uh, at the properties window, and it has stuff like uh, animation stance, which is like a constant animation. So right now it is actually animating. It's like breathing in and out. Kind of looks like it's alive. So that is the animation stance, the constant one. And there's also a play on start animation property. And this is something that you can use to like have it wave and then go back to just like hanging out breathing. So if we were to like choose the pistol shoot, it would shoot, but then go back to its animation stance, the constant one. So these these are more like temporary. The play on start animation are more like temporary ones. Um, and it says play on start because, uh, I mean, you can have it loop and stuff like that. There's some properties here. Um, and you can also have it like uh, have a playback rate. So this is just like when it spawns, it's going to play the animation. And then if it's not looping, it's just going to stop. Uh, so it's kind of like a one off type thing. So it can be good for some things, um, but there's not much control, right? Like maybe you want the skeleton to only wave w when the player approaches. There's no option for that. So. Um, just know that we're going to be using the play animation um, instead of an animation stance. So that way it's going to like go back to normal once it's done with its animation. So there is one for waving. Um, so we're going to be playing this animation when the player approaches. All right. Well, anyways, I was going through types. Um, so yeah, we have the animated meshes and we have static meshes, but they actually share a type. Um, this cube and skeleton. So they are objects, but they're also known as core meshes. So there's like a um, a tree of types in core, and it kind of defines like what you're able to do with that object. So this animated mesh, uh, this one has specific uh, properties that can do animations. This cube does not have those properties. Um, it's limited. Uh, it doesn't have the animation, but they do share some properties such as um, you can change the um, the material of the floor. You can also change the material of Carl. You can also move Carl up and down. You can do the same for the cube. So there's a lot of shared types um, that refer to like a generic type of uh, object in core. So if you're wondering like how do I know all the types that Carl is inheriting? Because uh, he is one type animated mesh, but he doesn't inherit like the general type, which is core mesh. And which inherits another one, which is just like core object. So there, there's all these different types, and it goes like a. Uh, if you're familiar with like the animal kingdom, you start uh, splitting up into like different types of animals, like mammals and uh, reptiles. So it, it's kind of like that. They kind of uh, cover. Um, uh, there's like, uh, yeah, just like a family of types that, uh, like a lineage of types. So like parent types and grandparent types. So if you're wondering how to find like all the different types that Carl is, so we know it's an animated mesh. Um, so we can go to our script helper here. So the script helper is nice because it actually lists the, the lineage of types that you can use. So if we go to animated mesh, it's going to have at the top here a kind of lineage of all the different types that uh, an animated mesh inherits. So it's going to also have all the stuff that's in core mesh. So if we go to core mesh, it's going to be like one up basically in the lineage. And now you can and still see all the different ones that a core mesh inherits, a core object, and then just a plain object. Um, so yeah, um, core object is a very popular type because it has all the stuff for like moving stuff around. So like. Even this folder right here is a core object. It has transform properties like position and rotation. Even though technically it's like invisible, it's just like in charge of holding all this stuff. It still has um, the properties and the functions to move it up and down. Um, you know, same goes for the floor. This is also inheriting core object. You can move the floor up and down. So a uh, core object you'll find has a lot of the stuff like rotating. Um, 
a lot of the generic stuff that you can do with objects, uh, you know, making bigger, changing the speed of it. Uh, you can make it follow other players or objects even, um, which is useful for like pets and stuff. Uh, you can have it uh, look at certain things, look at continuously. So like it's constantly rotating. So we might use the look at function for the, the Carl to look at the player. Um, one thing to know is that uh, core object and player are two different things. So if you notice, if we go down to the player, it's inheriting object, but not core object. So player is a different type of object. It's not considered a core object. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of like specific things that only a player can do and not a core object can do. So um, they kind of separated the two things because it's such a distinct type of object. It has like, you know, uh, death uh, spawning in the world and um, it has a different velocity, um, like impulses and stuff like that. So th there's a m movement hook. So kind of you can change the movement um, before it actually happens. Um, so there's a lot of uh, specific things that players can do rather than just core objects. So the two main uh, things that um, I find myself going through in the API is player and core object based on what I'm trying to do. Um, so those are the two main types that I'm uh, looking at. And then sometimes I have to look at the specific types, such as like animated mesh, if I need it to animate. Um, and then down near the bottom, we have namespaces. Um, these are uh, kind of generic, so they don't really fit into the types. They're more of like generic functions that you can do, such as like uh, getting the names of every player in the server. So you would find that in the game. Um, or UI, like turning the mouse on, for example, um, or turning it off. Uh, you would find that in the UI. Or getting the score of all the teams. There's there's a whole bunch of different uh, namespaces, we call them, and they have like specific things that you can do. Um, so you, I do find myself using this a lot as well. And uh, yeah, enums we might get to later on, but they're kind of just like fancy numbers, basically. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's get into coding actually. So let's uh, we have our friend Carl here, and I'm just going to create a script using the right click option, and we'll call this testing. All right, so to start uh, coding, you can right click your script and just click edit script, and then you'll get the internal editor. Um, if you're wondering how to do the external editor, um, you have to kind of do some setup for it. It's in our docs, um, so I'm not going to go into that right now, but that is a possibility if you're interested. Um, all right, so let's start by just doing a simple print. So if you're wanting to kind of test your code out, print is going to be your best friend. So we'll just say like, hi for now. So um, one thing to note is that in the internal editor, there's an asterisk when your code is not saved. So if you ever see that asterisk, make sure you're saving before you try to test it. So just control S is the shortcut. And then when you press play, the script is inside the hierarchy. So if it wasn't in the hierarchy, it's not gonna run. But since it is, it should have run already. And we check our event log, which is kind of like, you know, where we're gonna see all the, the errors and stuff like that. We'll see, we get our message, hi. So we know our script worked. All right, so now that we know our script is running, we can start doing some of the logic. So what we should start with is how do we, uh, we're gonna try to do something with Carl, our humanoid two rig object. So how do we tell the script uh, what's the object we wanna be changing? So this is where we're gonna talk about references. So uh, a big thing in scripting is how do you get a reference to something? How do you let the script know what you're talking about? Because if I say like Carl uh, dot name, if I want to change Carl's name, like how does it know what Carl is? How, how does this link to this object? There's no way for it to know right now. So um, this is where we're going to start. We're going to, there's a lot of different ways I could get a reference. Um, I'm going to show off the best way though, but uh, just know that this is not the only way to get a reference. So the best way, in my opinion, is by dropping it in as a custom property. And the reason it's the best way, in my opinion, is that when I drag in, so uh, by clicking the script, you can see its properties. At the bottom here, there's an add custom property. And another way to add a custom property is just by dragging it in. So I can drag in the humanoid2rig, 
And the bet it's the best way because it actually types out the code for me um, in order to actually have the reference. So um, by dragging in the humanoid two rig, it creates it as a custom property and it actually has this custom typed out code for me. So I can actually just copy and paste that. So now I have this variable. Uh, local is a um, keyword that creates a kind of, um, it, it's a local variable. And it's uh, what local means is that it's only useful in this script currently. Um, I can't use it outside the script. Uh, you would have to make it a global variable, which is the opposite. Um, not going to go into that, but uh, just good to know what local is doing there. Um, so you'll see that quite often for variables. Uh, you don't need this. This would be a public variable, not a global one, but it kind of saves some computer power by saying local. Um, so anyways, now we have this variable, humanoid 2 rig, and it's if you take a look at this, it might look a little overwhelming what's happening, but it's you getting the keyword script. So this is referring to itself, the, the script object, and it's getting the custom property. That's the next thing it's doing. It's using a function to get the custom property, and it's looking up this name for the custom property because you can have more than one custom property. So it's looking at the name, humanoid 2 rig, and then it's waiting for it to spawn because sometimes the script happens it's running before the actual object is in the game. So um, it's good to wait for the object if you know it's an object in the game. Um, so you'll see this for, for any object reference you're trying to use. All right, so now we have a reference. And um, you can actually change this variable name. It's not important what the name is. It's just as long as you're using this consistent, uh, consistently in your code. Uh, this name does matter. It has to match with this custom property name because um, that's what it's looking up, the custom property. So, okay, so now we have a variable, Carl. And Carl, this guy right here, is the reference to the object. So now we can do stuff with Carl. So if you remember, um, Carl is a animated mesh. And I, I think we're going to start by trying to change its name real quick. So if you go to animated mesh, you will see properties. So properties are kind of these guys right here. Uh, information about the object and one of them should be name but you might not see it here and you might be confused and the reason is is that it's probably in one of the parent um, types so like one of the inherited types of the generic types has the name property so uh, there is a way to change the name I think it's in core object if we were to search for it but just know that yeah the the API might not have all the properties because they're in the parent properties uh, the parent uh, type properties so um, yeah, I know there's a property name that we can. Uh, so why don't we start by just printing it, just to prove that it works. So I'm going to save my code. I'm going to press play. And at the bottom here, you can see it says humanoid 2 rig. So the name humanoid 2 rig is being printed in our event log. So it was able to read it. Um, so now we're going to get into reading and writing. So uh, by just printing it, I'm reading the name. I'm not actually changing it yet. So we'll do that now. So if I were to oops, if I were to try to change Carl's name, uh, let's change his name to Carl. Actually, might as well make sense. So if I try to change his name now, I'm trying to make it equal to something different, I'm going to get a error, and it's uh, going to be a context error. So now we can talk a little bit about context. So. Carl right now is in default context. So contexts are kind of these rules that we apply to uh, objects. So by default, uh, objects cannot be changed over time. Um, we have to enable networking in order for that to be uh, something that we can do. So um, we could right click Carl and make him networked. There's an option for enable networking. but for our uh, purposes, we're going to want to make a different context, not network context. We're going to use client context. And the reason for that, you may be wondering, is because when we're trying to animate Carl, we can only do stuff in client only. So you'll notice uh, sometimes it says client only or server only. Um, and sometimes it says read only. So if you remember, read means you can like print it out, but you can't actually change it. So you can't change the type of an animated mesh. It is an animated mesh. So you can never change that in code. Uh, so that's why it says read only. But this stuff is saying what context you can use these functions in. So we're going to be playing an animation. 
So we need to be in client context. We can't be in network context. So if you're a little confused what the contexts are, there's different rules for each one. Like if it has collision or if it can change over time, um, like moving platforms and stuff like that, you would want it to be networked because client doesn't have collision. Uh, we have a documentation page all about it. So uh, yeah, if you're a little confused, I would go to our documentation about context and you can see the rules right here, a little table that kind of explains um, network, client, and server stuff. But uh, yeah, I won't jump in too deep into that right now. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions about context, let me know. Uh, all right, so we have Carl, and we need him to be in client context so we can do animations and change stuff over time. So if you read the error, it's going to say make him networked or move him into a client or server context. So we're going to do server because we want him to animate. Um, so the way you do that, I'm right clicking Carl and then there's a create network context option and you can select new client context containing this. So that will put Carl inside of the context when you create it. So now Carl's in client context and if we save our code and press play, you'll notice it still doesn't work and that's because the script is not in client context. So not only does Carl have to be in client context, the script also has to be in order to do a client code. So um, now when it's in client context, our script is going to work. And you'll notice, I'm pressing pause, the name of Carl has changed. So it used to be a humanoid 2 rig, and now it's changed to Carl. So that, that's how we know our code is working. Uh, but when we stop the game, it goes back to normal, back to its default. So it's just like a temporary name change. All right, so now we know we can change stuff about Carl. So we're going to start, so we went over properties. So the way that you uh, access a property, I didn't really mention it, is by using the dot notation. So the reference, Carl, dot, and then the name of the property, name. Um, so what we're going to do now, though, is we're going to use our functions. So functions, if you remember, is like a task that we're uh, trying to set. So we're trying to play an animation. So we have this function, play animation. So I'm just going to copy it. And then you want to write, so when you copy from the script helper, it's pretty nice if you right click the blue link. Uh, because if you click the blue link, it will take you to the API page, if you didn't know. So you can kind of see examples and stuff if you're not sure how to use it. So that's useful. But if you know how to use it by reading the API, you can right click, um, copy. And then over here, when you paste it, it's going to kind of uh, set up the entire function with all the different parameters it needs. So. Um, we'll go into that in a sec, but just note that instead of using a dot for functions, we use a colon. And there's a reason for that, but I'm not going to go into it. Just know that when you're using functions, most of the time you're going to be using a, um, a colon instead of a dot. And then we have the name of the function, play animation, and then we have these pr uh, parameters, they're called. So um, if you're familiar with coding, you know what parameters are. They're kind of just information about what you're going to need for the function to do certain things. So uh, for this play animation function, we want to know which animation we're going to be performing. So we need the name of that, uh, that wave. So if we go back, we should be, yeah, so it's not there anymore, but we should be able to just search here by typing in wave, and then you'll get the official name, which is unarmed underscore wave. So you can just copy that and then delete it. And then in here, you're going to need to paste it, but it needs to be a type string. So that means you need quotes around it. Because if you don't have quotes, it thinks you're looking for a variable on an unarmed wave. So you'll notice we did that for Carl. I didn't really explain what strings are. But yep, strings are basically words in quotes. Um, it's the type in coding that lets you give it some, some typed words out. So yep, now it knows unarmed wave is the animation we're playing. And you may have remembered there's optional parameters. So if I wanted the animation to be constantly playing, like looping forever, you can actually set that up by adding a table. So tables are created using curly brackets. And you can pass in these optional parameters. So if you're wondering, like, what are my options, you can hover on top of the API. You can also go to the API page. And when you hover, it's going to give you all the different optional parameters. So you need to know the name of the parameter. So for example, uh, should loop. Um, and it has like some information about how to use it. It's a 
Boolean, which means it could be either true or false. So uh, we could put should loop the name of the parameter and then make it equal to something. Uh, so it needs to be either true or false. So now our animation for should forever loop an unarmed wave. So if we press play now after saving, you'll notice Carl will be infinitely waving at us. Um, but yep, that's how you do optional parameters. Uh, you got to make a table and then look at which parameter names you want to change. All right, so now we're able to play an animation. So this should now just play it once and then go back to normal forever. Um, but that's not when we want it to wave. We want it to wave when the player enters its like surrounding area. So now we're going to talk about triggers and events. So, uh, and please let me know if you're getting confused anywhere or have any more advanced questions. I'm happy to help. Um, all right, so now we have triggers. So to get a trigger, and I'll go over what a trigger is, you can search for it in core content. There's even like a shortcut nine or something on your keyboard, which is kind of crazy. Um, and you can also right click over here. It's one of the gameplay objects in the hierarchy create menu. Uh, you can find trigger here. Yeah, it's nine. Yeah, I don't know who, who uses this, but uh, you can press nine on your keyboard to make a trigger. So uh, yeah. A trigger, what is it? So um, you may not see this box. Uh, maybe they changed the, the default settings for it. Um, the gizmos sometimes are turned off if you press V on accident. So um, if you don't see like the surrounding box, make sure the gizmos are turned on by pressing V, the shortcut. And also make sure that you're selecting the trigger. And when you go to its properties, it should have edit, editor indicator visibility um, and you can change this to be always visible, uh, or you can make it always invisible if you don't want to see it ever. Um, but yeah, I like to always make it visible. So even when I click off of it, I can still see the, the trigger box. Um, so this is kind of like an invisible box that represents an area. So you can change the shape of it to be a circle if you want. Um, but the cool thing about it is that it has uh, specific events that will let it know if something has entered the area or exit the area. So this is useful if you need to check if the player ever, you know, enters an area or maybe collides with something. You can use triggers for that. Um, yeah, a lot of specific use cases for triggers. Um, you end up using them a lot when you're scripting uh, specific actions. Uh, another cool thing about triggers is that you can have it be interactable. So when you enter the trigger, it will have an option for like press F to uh, talk to Carl or whatever. Uh, so it's kind of like automatic UI that we set up. Uh, so it's just using this property, interactable, adding a label here. And then, uh, yeah, it it will pop up that label, whatever you said. Um, like, you know, talk. Uh, and it says F to talk or whatever. So uh, we're not going to be doing interactable stuff right now. But uh, yeah, just know that that's how you do that with triggers. So. All right, so we have this area, and when the player enters the area, we're going to want Carl to wave at us instead of always at the beginning of pressing play. So what we need to talk about now, so we talked about properties, we talked about functions. Now we're going to talk about events. So events are a way for us to detect something has happened. So uh, objects have uh, specific events. Um, so like the player has a bunch of events, like when it spawns, when it dies. Uh, that's how you can do stuff when the actual event happens. Uh, the triggers have useful events because it can say, like, when something enters the trigger area, do something. So we're going to be using that when it it's called the begin overlap event. So um, when you're first starting out, you might be confused on how to set up. So you're going to want to look at examples for setting up a trigger event. Um, but I'll go over it. So uh, the first thing we do is get a reference to the trigger object because we can't access anything. We can't access its events without getting a trigger. And we're also going to make sure trigger is a, inside of the client context. So um, for most things, you're going to want your objects to be the same uh, context as the script that's changing something about it. There are some, some cases where that's not true, but um, for the sake of simplicity, I'll just say that. So we're going to do the same process. We're going to drag in our trigger as a custom property, and we can just copy this line of code. 
All right, so, so now we have a trigger. And yeah, there's oh, a question yep, in the question. chat. Uh, it says, is it, yeah, is it possible to block a key bind in a trigger? Like the key bind shift. I have a question about triggers. Is it possible to block a key bind? So you're you're saying like uh, if you had uh, a action for the shift, like running, or you're saying like you want the player to interact using shift. Uh, okay, so when the player enters the trigger, you're going to disable the shift action. Yeah, so there's a action. Um, it's in the namespace. Oh, I hate it when it does this. All right, so in the bottom, we have our namespaces. Uh, ooh, I'm looking at the wrong page. And one of the namespaces is uh, what am I? Input. So what you can do, it, it's on the client side. You would have to do this. So when the player enters the trigger, you'd want to set a action as disabled. So there's a function here, disable action. So you need to know this the action name. So we can talk about um, binding manager real quick. So there, in every game, you're going to have a bindings manager. And this kind of just like lists all the default actions that a player can do. So if you had something for shift, um, it looks like there isn't anything for shift. But let's say you added a, a component that created a binding for shift. So you had something like um, running or a sprint, right? And then it said shift here. As long as you know the action name, you can disable it inside of your code. So uh, this is the important part. So if you do download something from community content, like a ship to run or whatever, you're probably getting a binding set um, in that uh, template. And it's going to be, so if you check out your bindings manager, you're going to see it probably at the bottom or the top of like custom bindings. And it's going to say like running or sprint. Um, so you just need to note the name. And then uh, in your code, you're going to just say, you know, when the player enters the trigger, disable the action. And then when the player exits the trigger, enable the action. So you just got to make sure you re-enable it after. So maybe I can do that real quick. But let's uh, let's go to, does that answer your question, though? OK, cool. Um, yeah, so let's go over events. So how do we detect when the player enters the trigger? So uh, the first step. We already did. We got a reference to the trigger. The second step is we need to get the specific uh, the event, and we're gonna uh, use it as a property. Basically, if you remember, you use the dot notation. So there's a trigger type. Uh, you can go and see its uh, properties and stuff. And we want the event. So uh, again, you can right click these, and it will most of the time give you useful stuff. So what's going to happen when I paste is that it's going to do the dot and then the name of the event, like a property. And then it's going to use this function here using the colon connect. So connect, it's saying like when the player enters or when something, you know, triggers this event, I want to connect that event to a function. So this is where the logic would be. Like, what do you want to happen when the player enters the trigger or when something enters the trigger? So this is where all the logic is going to happen. And you can like start typing a function here if you want. Um, so I could do like function. And then you know in here, inside the function, I could type all the thing. Um, what you'll usually see in people's code is that they make a function before the event. So they say like on um, overlap. So they're making a function here. And then what they'll do is that instead of making the function down here, they'll just put the name of the function. So it's a little more uh, spread out and a little cleaner uh, doing it this way. Uh, but the same thing. So now we can put all of our logic. Um, but there is one more thing to note when you're connecting a function to an event is that the event is going to be passing in values about the event. So like which trigger uh, was triggered or you know which trigger got overlapped and what object overlapped. And you're going to want to know this, because maybe it's not the player. Maybe it's like a, a bullet or something that overlapped. Um, so any object can trigger this. So 
um, we need to know what are the uh, data being passed into this function. That way we can accept it and it won't get mad at us. So the way that you know is in the API, it's going to have it uh, either underneath it or maybe to the side of it. Uh, it's going to have the different uh, values getting passed in. So we have a trigger object, lets us know which trigger um, started the event. And then it also has an object for letting us know which object um, you know, created the event. So we're going to need to know this because we want to know if the player, you know, overlapped. We don't want it to wave if a platform enters it. So what we're going to do is we're going to accept two things, the trigger, and you can and you can name these whatever you want. Um, actually, a better name would be other. So the trigger uh, is going to be the first one. You, you have to do it in the right order. And then other is going to represent the other object that ran into the trigger. So. Uh, the first thing we want to check is, is other the player? Because if not, we don't really care. So we're going to need to use an if statement to check what other is. So all objects have a function called is a. If you look at the object um, type, you're going to see there's a function is a. So almost any object in or every object in core can do this. And it can check what type it is. So we're going to check if it's if this object is a player type. Then, if it is a player, then we can do our unarmed wave. Now we know that this is the time to do it. So instead of doing it at the beginning, we're going to do it only when a player overlaps the trigger. So we'll save this, test it out. So when the player enters, it waves. And the cool thing about it is that the event will uh, continue to keep listening. It's not going to stop listening. Uh, once you connect it, the event will keep firing off. So that function will keep repeating whenever the event happens. All right. So we're at the 47 minute mark. So we have 13 minutes left. So I covered most of everything. I can continue with this, like maybe rotate the skeleton and stuff like that. Um, but I do want to leave it open if you guys had specific questions. So uh, I guess I will continue. Oh, yeah, we wanted to maybe do a, uh, so maybe I'll stop the player from crouching or something. Um, and you can basically just change crouching to shift. So if you wanted to disable a, a action, we're going to need to use the input uh, namespace. And I'm pretty sure disabling stuff is client only. Yep, so you can see it says client only for most of these. So we're going to disable an action and re-enable it. Um, so maybe we'll do like jumping. So you can't jump near Carl. So we're going to disable the jump action. So you just need to write the name of the, the action, which are listed here. Um, so we have jump, I'm pretty sure it's the top one, yeah. So we'll see if this works. Yep, I'm spamming spacebar, I can't jump. So that's how we know it works. But when I exit the trigger, I still can't jump. So maybe we want to change that. So we're going to need another event, because this is only checking when I overlap. But what ha what about when I you know exit the overlap? So we need another event from a, the trigger that's going to do the opposite. So uh, for the sake of being quick, I'm going to be using a script generator. And if we go to the trigger overlap event, there's a specific one just for triggers. We're going to want the one that ends in overlap. So it's going to give me this little example here. Um, just note that we're not going to be copying the first line because this is a reference to the trigger, which we already have. So we don't need to copy that. We're just going to copy the event and the function for the event. I'll just paste that at the bottom here. All right, so on end overlap. Oh, yep. So since it's in client, does it mean that other players won't see the waving? Uh, good question. So uh, we can test that. Uh, but to answer your question quickly, uh, they will see the waving. And the reason for that um, is that this function is checking if anything enters the so i'll i'll uh, i'll fully answer it because yes and no actually but if both players are in the server 
and one player enters a trigger, the other one that didn't will see the wave because this if statement is still checking if something entered the trigger, even if it's another player. It's not checking if it's the player, like, you know, the client player. Uh, there is a way to do that, though, if you just wanted to be waving for just the, the local player, we call it. Uh, you Instead of checking if other is just a generic player, you would check if it's the local player. So it would only wave if you're uh, waving. So that's actually a good uh a good question because what if the player enters the trigger, another player, then this function will run for the other player that didn't enter the trigger. So that, that would actually stop them from jumping. So we would actually want to change this if statement to be uh, checking if it's, you know, the local player that entered the trigger, not just any player, because then all the players will have their jump disabled. Um, but uh, I said yes and no, because if the player uh, entered the trigger and then the player joined the server late, um, this wave would not happen um, because this the the new player did not have this uh, script running at the time. So their Carl would just be standing still and they wouldn't have their jump disabled. Um, so that's kind of like a very uh, extreme edge case. But yeah, just know that it's it, this client script only runs when the player enters the the server. So there could be some weird edge cases where the player enters late in an animation, and you would you would maybe want to run some edge cases for that, like play the animation later if it's the long animation. Um, so yeah, let's let's actually do that real quick because that's going to actually break our game if we have more than one. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a, a local a variable called local player. Doesn't matter what the name is, but I like to use this for my stuff. And you can get the local player by using a namespace function. If we scroll down, this is a special function to get the local player. And you can only do this in client only. So it's perfect for any client script. If you need to get the local player, you can just copy this. Actually. Uh, yeah, so I just need to copy from here and paste it, and it will kind of set it up for me. So uh, the way they use namespaces is you say the namespace game dot and then the name of the function. So now this variable is the local player. So instead of checking if other is just the player, we can check if it's equal to the local player. So this is more specific. So it's still going to check if it's a player, but it has to be the the client player, not just any player. Um, but maybe you do want the wave to happen for any player. That way you don't get some weird stuff. But you only want it to disable the jump for the local player. Um, so what you can do maybe is set up two different if statements. So you could do something like, uh, if it's a player, so you have two different if statements. If it's a player, you play the animation regardless. That way you don't you know, get some weird uh, things, but only disable jump if it's, you know, the player we're talking about in the client script. I hope that made sense, but yeah, the the unarmed wave will play for every player, uh, but it will only disable it for the local player. Um, so now we're going to need to do the opposite. Oh, so uh, let me double check to make sure. Okay, thank you. I don't really see the difference between server context and client context. Is it only to clean up the project? Yeah, so client context versus server context. So um, when a uh, when you first log into a project, like you're the first person in the game, uh, it's going to spin up a server is what we refer to. And this is, you can think of it like out in the desert, you know, like, uh, it doesn't really matter. It, it's like, you know, it's running far away from you. And what you're doing is you're creating a client uh, version of the game and you're connecting to the server. So the server is relaying information back and forth to you, to each client. So when another another player joins the game, they're going to have their client version wherever they're at, you know, their laptop. And then they're going to connect to the server. So the clients aren't connecting directly. They're connecting across from the server. So it's kind of like a relay. The server may not even care about what the players are seeing. They care about like you know interact like uh, collisions. 
They're like, oh, the player should not be walking through the wall. I'm going to stop it. Um, so the client scripts are only doing stuff on the client, uh, like on each specific computer. Uh, they're not controlling like the player score and stuff like that. Like all the important stuff that should not be manipulated by the, you know, the players, like or else they could cheat. Um, that's all handled by the server, and that's getting relayed back and forth to the clients. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a very broad definition of client versus server. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I can maybe do an example real quick, but uh. Let me just finish this real quick before I get to that. So when the player exits the um, trigger, we're going to enable it only if it's the local player again. That way it doesn't do some funky stuff uh, for other players still in the trigger. And I think that's it. So yeah, let's, let's do a little testing. So now we can talk about multiplayer uh, preview. So when you want to test like the server version versus the client version, and instead of just pressing play normally, you're going to want to use multiplayer preview mode. And this will give you a more accurate representation of what the server is doing versus what the client's doing. So when you press play, you may have noticed something. Everything disappeared, right? And that's because the server does not. So this is now representing what the server sees. The server doesn't care about anything in client context. That's not being created for the server. That's getting ignored by the server. So it doesn't care what Carl looks like or animating. Um, each client cares. They they need to make sure they can see the Carl. So uh, the player is not going to see this. So this is you know the thing out in the desert. It only cares about collision. So it knows the ground needs to be there for the player not to fall through it and stuff like that, or where the player spawns and stuff like that. So um, once you're in multiplayer preview mode, you can add clients by pressing this little guy with the plus sign. So we'll add a player. And you'll notice when the player spawns in, you'll see the player in the server. And if we go to the client mode, now we can see all of its uh, client stuff. So let's um, let's add another player. You can add as many players as you want, or maybe just up to the maximum that your project allows. I haven't actually tested that. So let's see what happens when one player enters. Oh, let me I use that. Let me use this. All right. So if one player enters the trigger, we should expect it to wave, but not stop the player from jumping if it's not inside the trigger. So I can't jump on the on the right player. I'm spamming the space bar. But this guy is able to jump. So that's the difference between a uh, local versus um, just any any player. That if statement we specified, only the local player that entered the trigger will stop from jumping. So each player has their own client script. Their machines are running the client script separately, but that doesn't mean that their script can't detect other players. They still have references to any object entering the trigger. So every every player is going to see that animation. But they won't always sync up. So that's the that's the thing about client context is that you can't ensure that every player's version is happening at the same time. There may be some lag. But for waving, it's not that important. All right, cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, contexts are a beast in their own, but um, when, once you start seeing like these common problems, you'll kind of start to realize what, like if uh, the big thing is like, uh, what is it, uh, UI pop-ups. So like if a player enters a trigger, they may see a pop-up. But if every player sees that pop-up, then you get some weird game-breaking stuff. So you're going to want to check if it's the local player, then display the client. UI for them only. What's up, Wayne?